will, turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13. We concentrate on verse 13 this morning. Next week, we move to a new paragraph. So this is a, a milestone in our preaching series. Uh, I heard a person say this week uh, that they were really enjoying uh, Romans 12. Amen. <laughs> it doesn't count if I have to beg, okay? But uh, it was saying, I really enjoy Romans 12 because it's, it's so practical, you know? And it is. It's, it's a very practical kind of chapter. It talks about things that you do, you know, loving one another, not being hypocritical and giving and being generous and, and you know, all those kinds of things. It's a lot of very practical advice. And so I appreciated it. It was, it was, it was a very nice compliment. I love Romans 12. It's so practical. As if Romans 1.11 wasn't. See, but, but let me ask you to think about this for a second, because 1 through 11 is heavily theological. It talks a, a lot about uh, uh, what it means to be saved and a sinner saved by grace and, and, and who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for us. There's a lot of theology, divine doctrine in chapters 1 through 11 that, that a, a lot of times we look at and we sort of say, well, that, that's kind of hard to understand. It's kind of hard to, uh, to put into perspective and to explain. But when we get to chapter 12, I understand that that's that's things that you can do and so it's very practical i like that and that theology stuff well you know okay we'll endure that uh, a little bit but what i want you to think about is the fact that when you have doctrine you know the sound doctrine of who god is who christ is who the holy spirit is you have sound doctrine and then you have practical uh, application of that doctrine if you remove the doctrine of the gospel of christ from the practical chapters of the bible you are left with nothing <coughs> You are left with nothing at all. It becomes simply a matter of, of preaching do-goodism. Let's all hunker down and try to be nice people. Now, here's what happens. It happens in the lives of, of individuals. It'll happen in your family across generations. It will happen in churches. It happens in denominations. That you will start out and you will know that your salvation is based on that doctrine, that your salvation is based on the fact that Jesus Christ came took the, 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 the fashion of a man, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the dead on the third day, and now the Holy Spirit has awakened our hearts to claim Jesus as our Lord, to accept that gift of grace from the cross of Jesus Christ, and because of Jesus, we are now saved. We are translated from darkness into light. We are translated from death to life itself. We come from a, a, a state of not belonging to a state of belonging to God. We are translated into the family of God. All those things happen because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I pray you never lose the excitement and the fervor of that moment, whatever it looked like in your life, whatever it was like in your life, that you remember the moment that God tapped you on the shoulder and said, you're mine from now on. And you said, praise God, that's what I want. And you responded to the grace of God. I want you to keep that in mind. But we start there, we start with a very theological moment. But what will happen sometimes, say in, in churches, we'll, we'll preach the gospel, we'll preach salvation, we'll preach uh, the necessity, necessity for forgiveness from sin, we'll, we'll preach divine judgment uh, on, on our, on our uh, lives and our hearts and the divine grace uh, extended to us. We'll, we'll preach all these doctrines and then after a while, we'll, we'll, we'll preach the practical application of that. And I'll tell you something, the response will be so great to the practical application that well, we'll preach an occasional sermon on the doctrine, but we'll preach a lot of practical application, and we'll mention doctrine, and then we'll preach more practicality, and, and we'll have our doctrine on our web page in a what we believe tab, but there when we talk about who we are as a church, we'll say, we preach practical life application sermons. You know this is true because you've seen it on web pages, haven't you? We preach practical sermons. When I read that the first time, I think that was my first step towards telling you that the most practical thing you can do with your life is live for the glory of God. Amen. The most practical thing you can do with your life is to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The most practical thing in your life is to be shaped and formed by the doctrine of who Jesus is. Okay. 
But when you get over here and you're talking about practical life application sermons, and we're just going to talk practical things, practical things, and we leave out the, 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 the other things, then eventually what happens is your kids come to church with you, and what they hear are practical sermons that say, now be nice. I mean, that, that's basically, you know, shape up and, and, and fly right. I mean, every, ser- every practical sermon is basically that. Be nice, shape up, fly right. That, that's every practical sermon. And your kids are going to listen to that, and they're going to say to themselves, why am I here? I get that at school. I get that from the media. I get that from my friends. I get that from society. I get that from culture. Why am I here? The reason we're here is because the, the practical application of Christianity demands a life investment in who Jesus Christ is in the doctrine. And that's what you won't get anywhere else. That's what you won't get anywhere else. That's why we proclaim the scriptures and we try our best to proclaim the whole scriptures and the whole counsel of God and withhold nothing from you because I want you to live in the excitement of God's grace for us in Jesus Christ and then see how that applies to our lives. Why? Not so we can be better people, not so we have practical hints, but so that we might glorify the Father through the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's an entirely different way to apply um, the, the, the practical application of the Bible. One is, I want to be better. The other is, I want God to be glorified. And where we are is that God must be glorified in us. And that's what we're reading about in Romans chapter 12. We're reading about how God can be glorified in how we live, which is why we spend all that time on Romans 1 through 11, and I'm not, if, if I can, I don't want you to, I'm not going to let you be forgetting what's in Romans 1 through 11. If you want to summarize it in one word, it is the, well, three words, the mercies of God. Amen. That's why Paul starts out in, in 12, 1, he says, I beseech you, by the mercies of God, I want you to do these practical things because God is merciful and we need to be merciful. God is glorious. We need to reflect his glory. God is good. God is truth. God is, God is, is compassionate. Those attributes of God must be reflected in our lives. And that's why it's all based on the mercies of God. You stop teaching. You stop proclaiming the mercies of God. All you have is do-goodism and eventually people say, why am I bothering? But you preach Christ and you latch onto Christ and you'll know why. And you'll never let go, and your children won't let go, and your church won't let go. And that's why we're here. Does that make sense to you? That's why it's critical that we did 1 through 11. And that's why it's critical we start out with by the mercies of God. But we are reading this morning verses 9 through 13, Romans chapter 12, 9 through 13. um, And then next week we move on from this, this paragraph. But I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to let love be genuine, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And contribute to the needs of the saints. And seek to show hospitality. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, how grateful I am for the gift of your Holy Spirit that awakens our eyes to the truth of your word. Father, the movement of your spirit in us and among us to to give us that courage of faith to latch on to who you are, to have our hearts and our lives bound to your character and your nature. Father, we look at the wondrous glory of who you are and we know we are so far from it we could never attain that. But, Father, in some miraculous way, your Holy Spirit uses us to proclaim your glory. And I thank you for it. I thank you for the gift of Jesus. I thank you that you have given to us the knowledge and the certainty of salvation. I thank you, Father, for the wondrous way in which you work in our lives constantly, day by day and moment by moment, to bring us to a place of usefulness in the work of your kingdom. And so, Father, I pray that this morning in this place, in this worship service, your Holy Spirit would superintend our thoughts, that you would change our hearts, that you would guide our our will. Father, that you would just bring us to yourselves, that we would sing your praises 
with lives changed by the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We glorify you. Pray in Jesus' name. It's a very short verse. Uh, you, you can almost memorize it uh, uh, while you're sleeping through the sermon. You can memorize it. Uh, basically, he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and pursue hospitality. I want you to give for the work of the ministry, give to the needs of the saints, and show hospitality, pursue hospitality. Uh, some time ago, we talked about the notion of generosity. You remember that? Uh, that's the one where I asked you to tip generously. You've all been doing that. And don't, don't, yeah, don't the restaurants just love to see First Baptist Church of Waldorf people coming in? They know that they're going to get tips whether they're good at it or not. That the lousiest service is going to get 30% tip. You haven't been doing that, have you? And I just remind you, what kind of tip did God give you for the service you gave him? And uh, when you keep that in mind, make your tipping uh, just an act of worship to God, just to remind us to be generous uh, with our resources. But, but here Paul says, I want you to contribute to the needs of the saints. And uh, the most likely um, application of that that he has in mind is actually giving to the work of the, of the local congregation, whatever the need might be to, to participate um, in that. Um, the, the way in which things were funded back they, then were a little bit different than perhaps uh, we have today. Um, but uh, there was always some kind of financial need. The ancient synagogues, by the way, were not funded by collection plates. Um, they were not um, supported financially by people uh, sort of sitting in the room and all putting money in and contributing together. The synagogues, by and large, were built and uh, supported by a patron. That would be a wealthy person, maybe two, but usually one wealthy person in the community who would build the synagogue building and then support whatever financial need uh, the synagogue congregation might have. Uh, for example, you remember a centurion came to Jesus one time and said, my servant is home and he's sick. I want you to come and heal him. And the Jewish people in the area, they went up to Jesus and said, you've got to heal this man's servant. He's worthy of this because he built us our synagogue. He built our synagogue for us. And uh, just looking at that, that, that's just a historical incident, perfectly in keeping with what we know. This is what usually happened. A wealthy person would, would fund uh, the synagogue. Now, in the earliest uh, history of the church in the book of Acts, for example, uh, what we find are that people, Christians, were meeting together in homes. And uh, they didn't have a separate building unto themselves. But when you think about it, in order to have a place where a large group of people could meet, it had to be a larger home, which usually meant maybe a wealthier person uh, would, would make their home available. It was a way, by, it, just to jump the gun, it was a way of showing hospitality. Uh, Lydia would be a good example of that uh, for the early church. And so uh, the needs of the church were supported uh, by people who had resources and would donate that uh, to them. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, there, there were financial needs. There would be financial needs for any group uh, traveling around like that. And uh, the book of Luke, chapter 8, starting at verse 1, uh, tells us that the ministry of Jesus was financed by women of means. And so we are returning to that model today, and uh, we are going to let the WMU, uh, the women's missionaries, uh, okay, but, but what it says is that there were women of means, and they were contributing and supporting the financial needs of, of the ministry of Jesus there as well. Uh, in the book of Acts, we know that um, in, uh, oh, it was about 46, 47 A.D., um, a prophet by the name of Agabus uh, prophesied, he said, there's going to be a worldwide famine and there's going to be a great need in the city of Jerusalem. And so what happened was that uh, other churches in the surrounding area took up a special collection and sent money to Jerusalem uh, to support the Christians there during a famine. And we know this from historians such as Suetonius, um, that there was a famine in uh, the Jerusalem in Judea uh, in the years right around 47, 48 AD. So um, and there was financial need all the time. A lot of Paul's work in ministry 
as he went around the world, was reminding Gentile Christians that they needed to be supporting the Jerusalem Christians because a lot of the burden financially for um, establishing the gospel was falling on the Jerusalem church. A lot of people would travel there. They would have to be uh, housed and fed and entertained and, you know, whatever else uh, would need. So there was a, a great financial need, and so churches were, were contributing, and Paul was encouraging that as well. So uh, there was a financial need, and so Paul says, contribute to the needs of the saints. Saints. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Now, let me tell you something about the grace of God. A God who has everything lets us give him something. Isn't that amazing? God who has everything allows us to give something. You see, the need for financial stewardship, the need for, for giving, as we said when we were talking about generosity, but and, and the need for giving is to set us free. It's not to fund the kingdom of God. God has all of it. God's kingdom will not uh, fall. But we get the joy of participating in that work. And so just very quickly, because I want to move on to hospitality, but when Paul says, I want you to be giving to the needs of the saints, I want you to be supporting the work of the local congregation, um, that, that's, that's something that we preach and something that we want for you, but it's not a, as a fundraising mechanism. It's not because, uh, you know, somehow we've got to get, get our money. Rather, the reason we need to be generous and the reason we need to be give, giving is so that we will be set free from the crude materialism of our world and we will stop thinking that our lives are defined by how much money we have, the size of our house, or the, uh, the kinds of vacations we take. We need to be set free from that crude materialism of our world. See, too many of us think about money as though it were a life jacket. A life jacket is one of those things you put on and it floats. And so if things get tough, like the boat sinks, uh, then, then you're in the water and you're bobbing up and down. Well, you have the life jacket on. And we think that that's what money is. Money's going to give us this security. If anything ever happens, we're going to float above it all because we have money. Money is not a life jacket. Money is that lead-lined vest the dentist puts on you when he takes an x-ray. That's what your money is, and it's going to sink you every time. You know, you put your hope in money, you put your, your, your value of yourself in money, you, you, you invest your life in money, and you're going to wind up sinking to the bottom. And so the reason I want you to be generous in giving and why Paul says contribute to the needs of the saints is, is so you'll be set free from these things that are killing you. I say this because I, I, I want you to be suited for heaven. I want when you get to heaven, you're a little bit better prepared for the experience. When you, you know, invest all your time and money and all your hope and money and all your, all your resources and trying to get more money and you think that's defining you and you're, and you're living this materialistic world and you're going to get to heaven and you're going to find that all that gold that you got is nothing but dirt in the streets. I want you to be ready for heaven that when you get there, you don't have to squeeze through the eye of a needle. I want when you get to heaven and you're doing nothing but singing the praises of a glorious Father and the Lamb upon the throne and, and just exulting in, in the marvelous mercy and grace that is showered upon us and you sing praises of the Father. I want you to have done that already so you already know the words. And you can't do that if you're tied in to money. I want you to be better suited for heaven. I want you to have the joy of participating in the work of the kingdom. Now, there's just something satisfying by knowing that something you gave was used in the life of another person to bring them closer to the throne of God. I want you to have that joy. I want you to, to know what it's like to be used by the Father's hand in a small way, just in, in the way of financial giving. So that, that, those are the kinds of things that I, I, um, I want for you. And I want you to have perspective on your money. One of the first things that giving to the work of the kingdom will do for you, it'll put the rest of your money in perspective. See, there's, there's two ways to give uh, uh, to charity, um, if you will, but to give to churches. And one is, if I have anything left over, then I'll give it to God. God who did not give us leftovers, who gave us his son. But we said, you know, if I have anything left over, I'll give, I'll give it to God. And I can guarantee you, you'll never have anything left over. 
But if you start on saying the first fruits, what I have, first of all, I will first give that away. And, and, and like, like I say, don't, don't think, and I'm not raising fun, uh, you know, money here. If, 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 you know, if you think that, give your money to something else. You know, you don't, you don't need to give it to this church. This isn't the only place to give. It's the best place to give, but it's not the only place to give. <laughs> you know, but just find some way to get that, that, that gift out to somewhere where it's needed. And when you do that, it'll put a perspective on the rest of it. You'll, you'll do a lot less impulse buying. You'll do a lot less borrowing. Uh, your credit card will become a, a seldom used item. And if you do use it, you'll pay it off at the end of the month. All those good sound financial principles will come into play when first you put everything into perspective. It belongs, all of it belongs to God. I will acknowledge that by giving some away right off the top. And then I'm, I'm going to use the rest for God's glory. Um, so that, that's sort of what we're talking about. The reason we don't give, by the way, is we're not satisfied. We don't give because we think we need more in order to be satisfied. But if you are satisfied in the grace of God, if you are satisfied with what the Father has done for you in Christ Jesus, if you're satisfied in God, you'll be set free from your money and from possessions and from materialism and you'll be set free to be generous and to give it away and to support and give to the needs of the saints, all right? So that, that's the first uh, part of verse 13, and just wanted to uh, touch upon that very quickly, contribute to the needs of the saints. Then secondly, he says, seek hospitality. And that word seek means chase after it, pursue it. In other words, there are some people who have a gift of hospitality, there are some people who just love to entertain. They love to invite people home. They love putting on dinners. They love cookouts. Uh, they love inviting people over and having them stay. They love having house guests. And if you have the hospitality, praise God for you. Let us know. We want to abuse you. <laughs> but we have, uh, we have interns who are being housed by gifts of hospitality this summer. We have uh, uh, kids who are coming in and working with the All About Kids camp. They need housing. Uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, but those are the kinds of ongoing needs that we have. So if you have a gift of hospitality, you know, let it be known will help you exercise your gift. Most of us have a gift of, well, you want to come to dinner? <laughs> and that's about it. Yeah. We don't really pursue hospitality. Hospitality is more than just entertaining somebody. It's, it's more than just having folks over for dinner. Hospitality is a mindset. It's, it's an approach to other people. Hospitality is looking at folks and saying, how can I serve them? How can I invite them into my life in some way? There was an Old Testament expectation of hospitality. You may remember the story in the book of Genesis when uh, Abraham uh, looked out of the door of his tent and there were three guys standing there. And he knew they weren't Mormons because they hadn't been invented yet. So, but he, but he, he looked at him, there were three guys there, and he said, you know, these, these folks have shown up at my tent. So he ran out to him and says, hey, hey, sit down sit under the tree in the shade. Here, I'm going to get you some water. I'm going to get you something to eat. He ran to his servant and says, I want you to put on a, a spread and, and, and bring us some, and some food. And so he entertained these, these travelers as they were coming by his tent because there was that expectation if somebody came near your tent and they were traveling, you were going to feed them and give them some water and help them clean up and, and just show some hospitality toward them. You remember Job. Job was the guy who lost everything in the patience of Job. Yeah, uh, but he, he was the, the, the guy who lost everything. And at one point, he's telling other people as much as telling God why he doesn't deserve to suffer. And he's saying, here are all the good things I have done. And one of the things Job says is, I have never let a traveler go by my property without feeding him. Nobody ever came by my house except that I fed them. They'd drive by, I'd throw hamburgers in their windows and things. <laughs> but but that, that was the expectation. The expectation was that you would entertain the traveler. Jesus benefited from the hospitality of others time and time again. It, 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 have you ever thought about how many times Jesus is having dinner at somebody's house? By and large, that's because they invited him. <laughs> you know. They, they wanted him there. One guy invited him out and said, Jesus, come to my house for dinner. Sure, I'll come to your house for dinner. Uh, by the way, let me tell you a few, few things. Next thing you know, the guy's roof is torn open, a guy's lowered down, and Jesus is proclaiming forgiveness of sins. But um, that, that's another story. 
but a guy, another guy invites Jesus over and says, you want to come to a party? I'm, I'll feed you dinner. Jesus says, that's great. And while they're having dinner, this woman, that woman, you know, uh, comes in from uh, the, 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 the community and starts washing the feet of Jesus. And Jesus starts telling his host, whose name is Simon, he starts telling him about the love and the forgiveness of God and our response uh, to it, you know. So uh, Jesus uh, was oftentimes um, the, the beneficiary of the hospitality of others. And so when Paul says pursue hospitality, he's not bringing up a foreign concept. He's talking about something that's been in the forefront of the thinking of God's people all throughout the pages of the Bible. Now, the word that he uses, the Greek word that he uses for um, uh, uh, hospitality is philoxenia. Um, and uh, I know that that means not as much to you as it does to me, but philo, zeknia, philo is uh, like Philadelphia, a brotherly love, uh, uh, philodendron, love treat. No, that's not right. <laughs> I don't know why that just occurred to me. But uh, uh, philoxenia means the love of the stranger. That, that word xenia comes from xenos. Xenos is the first part of xenophobia. You know, you hear a lot about xenophobia today with the immigration discussion and all that, and I don't, I don't want to get into that and, and, and all that, but simply the, the word xenophobia means fear of strangers. That word xenos means stranger. Xenophobia, fear of strangers, fear of foreigners. Uh, by the way, xenophobia is not a uh, listed disorder by the American Psychiatric Institute. It's just a, it's just a made-up word, uh, but, it, but it's useful. Uh, for, for some people. But xenophobia is fear of the stranger. Uh, philoxenia is love of the stranger. And that's what hospitality is. It's loving that strange person in your <laughs> life. Yes, it is. You know, we, we hesitate to love strangers. Now, one of the reasons we hesitate to love strangers is because they're strange. <laughs> They're not like us. They don't look like us. They're not one of us. They don't dress like us. I don't know what their values are. I don't know how they're going to behave. I don't know how they're going to respond. I don't know where they're coming from. I don't know when they're leaving. You know, so, you know and all those. <laughs> they, they are strange. And because they are strangers, we sense danger. Now, there's a little bit of wisdom to that, by the way. There's a little bit of wisdom. What do, what do we teach our children? Don't talk to strangers. Guy might be the, the best person in the world. She might be the, the most marvelous saint there ever was, but I don't want my kid talking to them until I know who they are because there's an element of danger, and it requires a lot of wisdom. I mean, this is why we don't pick up hitchhikers anymore. Told you about that. There was a time when you could go across the country just hitchhiking and you know every ride would be a great experience. Then the people hitchhiking figured out, you know, once you get a car to stop, you can do a lot of mischief. And the drivers of cars figured out that if you pick up a hitchhiker, you can do a lot of mischief. And because, uh, folks, it's original sin. Any good thing, eventually, human beings will distort with their sin. And we did that to hitchhiking. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm grateful for cell phones. If you're in trouble, I'll, I'll call somebody for you. <laughs> so Jesus told a parable. About, uh, <laughs> well, actually, come on. <laughs> now, the parable of the Good Samaritan is all about a guy who's walking down the road, and there is a stranger to whom he owes nothing, and the guy is, is, is hurting, but he is a stranger. He's not like me. And I don't know what will happen if I try to interact with him. And yet Jesus said, love of your neighbor is like this. You, you love someone who's different. And you pick them up and you try to help them along the way. It requires a lot of wisdom and a lot of grace and uh, things like that. But a lot of times we, we hold back from, uh, from strangers because we sense a lot of, of danger uh, being there. But you know, a stranger is not just a danger. A stranger is an opportunity. There's an opportunity for a real blessing when you meet somebody new in your life. I remind you about Abram, Abraham, you know, with the three guys who visited him. You know who they turned out to be? They were angels. In fact, the, the, the passage starts, it says, and the Lord came to Abram and he saw three men. 
And, you know, if you're into Trinity, you're, you're off to the races right about now. But the, these angels came, and they brought a word from God to Abram, and they said, look, we're going to come back uh, this time next year, and when we do, you're going to have a son already. And um, Abraham uh, sort of wondered about that, but Sarah really took it, uh, his wife uh, took it strangely because she said, you know, it is uh, no longer with me in, in the way of women as, you know, okay, you get the point. You know, says, this, this isn't going to happen. And uh, the, to shorten the story, yes, it did. <laughs> you know, and uh, a little surprise child going on. The, but, so, uh, but Abraham was blessed when he entertained these strangers. And I want to remind you that to a lot of people, Jesus was awfully strange. You know, everything that people knew, he didn't know. He didn't know that there were limits to how you love people. He didn't know that it was foolish to set your life into the hands of God and just trust him for everything. He didn't know that religion was good and made you a good person, and that's what God wanted. Jesus was strange in that way. Albert Schweitzer, for example, um, it, his phrase was that Jesus comes to us as one unknown. If you think you understand Jesus, you don't know him yet because he's deeper and more profound than you can ever imagine. He comes to us as a stranger. There's a beautiful song called The Stranger of Galilee. Stranger of Galilee, and uh, we, don't, we don't sing it anymore. You have to look it up, but if you do, you, you, you'll just be delighted. The chorus is, oh, I think I could love him forever. The stranger of Je Galilee. Jesus was a stranger to so many people, but when they invited him home, how they were blessed when they got to know him. They, they, they didn't quite understand him. They thought he was a sort of an oddball but when they opened their heart to him and when they invited him into their house and they fed him dinner and they entertained him and showed him hospitality, they were blessed beyond measure. I remind you about the two uh, guys who were walking on the road to a town called Emmaus. And as they were walking along, Jesus had just been crucified and, and had not appeared to them yet. And they're walking along and Jesus comes up to them. They don't recognize him. He's a stranger. And if I have just suffered the loss of my friend, and I think he's been murdered on a cross, and I'm walking along, and somebody comes up to walk with me. Basically, it's, well, um, glad you're here, buddy, but, you know, really, I'm, I'm dealing with, with stuff right now. Leave me alone. But these two men, they engaged with Jesus. They showed him a kind of hospitality. And when they got to their destination, they said to Jesus, why don't you come in and have dinner with us? You remember that? They showed him hospitality. And when they did, and Jesus took the bread and he started praying and thanking the Father and blessing the food, suddenly they realized who this stranger was. You see, when you showed hospitality to Jesus, there was a blessing in it. Now, I'm not going to tell you that everybody you meet is an angel. In fact, the odds are not, but what I will tell you is every person you meet, God can use to enrich your life. If you just take the time to listen to them, to learn something from them, to share something with them, to let God use something about that person to challenge who you are and maybe, maybe show you something about yourself that you need to know, the new person you meet in your life can be a great blessing by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons, show hospitality because every newcomer is a potential blessing in your life. I want you to know it's also painful to be the stranger. You probably know that. When you're the new kid on the block, everybody else knows what's happening and you're the only one who doesn't. And there's about four or five people who've decided to pick on you and nobody's going to stick up for you because after all, you're the strange kid on the block, you're the new one. I know about this from personal experience. I remembered it during therapy, <laughs> through hypnosis. <laughs> no. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I went to four different high schools. Four different high schools. Uh, that, that's like, do the math, folks, if you can. That's like one per year. 
you know, and two of those high schools I started about two weeks late because it was military moves and we were late getting in the community and the housing school district and all that. And so what happens is that I walk into these schools and I'm not just the new kid with a bunch of other new kids, I'm the only new kid. You know, two weeks ago they were new kids, now two weeks later they've all settled in. I'm the only kid who doesn't know what's going on. And I can tell you that can be kind of frightening. I mean, my senior year, went to Westminster High School, didn't know a soul. I was an outcast. <laughs> Alone and suffering. <laughs> Folks, I want you to know, I don't remember a single one of those students except one, and I married her. You see, the stranger can be a blessing, <laughs> as she has been to me. <laughs> yes, okay. But it's painful to be the stranger, and if, and if you, you get in touch with that and you realize that, then you're going to be a little bit more sensitive to what's going on in the life of another person. Because showing hospitality isn't just about helping people feel better and getting to know folks and being more and more friendly. Showing hospitality is all about reflecting the character and nature of God and showing something of the mercy that he has shown us to others. I mean, we get this in the opening pages of the Bible. I, I just want to read this for you, just a couple of verses. It's found in Leviticus um, chapter 19. This is verses 33 and 4. But God is talking to the Israelites as they're going through the wilderness. And one of the things he says to them is this. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You just don't mistreat the strange guy, the new guy. You know, the, the reason we're reading Romans 12 is because we want our kids to be Romans 12 Christians. We want them to have the gospel lived out in their lives. And one of the main things we're looking for is how do we treat one another? What, we, what do we do with the person who's being left out? Do we pause and say, come along with us, or do we just leave them out to fend for themselves? And that's true whether you're, you're a child or whether you're, you're a student or whether you're a young adult, an adult. Uh, it, it, it's, just, it, it's just a matter of do we look around to figure out, is there somebody here who needs an invitation to join us? Or am I just leaving them out and, and sort of passing them off? Because God says when, when somebody's going to be a part of your life, when someone's going to join your life, it's going to be the new neighbor, the new kid in school, the new co-worker. He says, don't do them wrong. Don't treat them wrong. Lee. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. You shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. See, God is saying, remember where you were. You were an outcast people. You were strangers. Nobody cared about you. And now God has, has set you free and he's, he's brought you into, into the orbit of his will and, and he's just working in you for his glory. Remember what it was like when you were a stranger, though, and share that same kind of love and compassion for others. Because the very last part of this passage of Scripture goes like this. Because God tells them why. Here's why. I am the Lord your God. I'm the Lord your God. You know, there was a time when we were kind of like strangers to God. I mean, talk about strange. We didn't talk like God. You know, when God speaks, things happen. When we speak, we just confuse everything. We don't act like God. When God acts, love and mercy and grace flow down. When we act, we just annoy people. We don't look like him. We don't act like him. We are so far distant from who God is that we are strangers to God. In fact, we are alien to God. In fact, we are enemies of God. 
And yet with hospitality, he reached out and he invited us to himself through Jesus Christ, his son. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for our sins. And he died when we cared nothing about God. And dying for our sins, he gave us the opportunity that we might know him by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus raised from the dead on our behalf. He did that for us, that we might have new life and have life everlasting and have life abundantly. God did that for us. So if you want to see what the model of hospitality is, just think about your Father in heaven and how he invited you into the house to be with him. Now, in our lives, um, again, there's some people who are wonderfully adept at... Uh, uh, having a house that's ready at a moment's notice to entertain whomever comes down the road. Um, most of us struggle with that, but praise God for those who have that gift. It makes the rest of us ashamed. Uh, but the, 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 the point being is we can all be attuned, however. We can all have our antenna up and sensitive and to be aware of that person who needs an invitation, that person who needs to be included. I mean, it just starts just in our church fellowship. I mean, uh, Debbie talked about the challenge. I'll get to that in a second. But, but here's the mini challenge. Just from, from where you're sitting to your car, just have your eyes wide open. Is there someone I could say hello to? Hi, how are you? Glad to see you. Look forward to seeing you next week. It, you know, just to be hospitable to somebody. But the challenge is this, and the, this, this is an easy one, folks. Everybody can do this. There's a little poster board in the lobby. You haven't seen it because you're not paying attention, but it's out there. It's out there and has little leaves on it, and on each leaf there's a, there's a description of something you can do in vacation Bible school. Oh, no, I don't do vacation Bible school. Well, just tell the kids that. Yeah. I, I want to give you a chance to be hospitable to our children. How's that? But there, there's a list of things to do uh, and I'll, I'll confess, I know what some of them are and others I don't know, uh, but just, just take one. Uh, give you a hint, uh, what is it, crew leader? Um, I think one of them's called crew leader. Um, that, that's the easy one. <laughs> so everybody rush and take that one. But if you would take that and let us know and become a volunteer in our vacation Bible school, that will give you a chance to show hospitality to some children. And I can guarantee in our vacation Bible school, there will be some children who need to be invited into a loving relationship with Christ. You have a chance to show hospitality. I, I just challenge you to do that. If nothing else, walk over to the board, look at it, <laughs> pretend to take one. <laughs> I mean, just, you know, set the tone, you know, just something like that. But you, you can respond. This is easier than tipping $20, isn't it? So, <laughs> so do that. But the, but the point is this. When we are satisfied in who God is, then we have the courage to show hospitality to others and to love them the way the Father loves them and to give ourselves to them the way the Son gave himself for us. So that's the challenge. Support the needs of the saints and pursue, actively chase after hospitality. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the invitation that brought us to your presence and into your family. Thank you for supplying the means in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that continues to work in us and to perfect that salvation. But Father, I would pray right now that your Holy Spirit would come upon us in a fresh way, that throughout this coming week you would remind us again and again and again of our need to be open to others, inviting toward others that you would enrich our lives and bless us through that new person that we are yet to meet. Father, I just ask that you would work for your glory and that you would do so in the name of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.